Section twelve of A Book of Scoundrels by Charles Wibley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shepherd and Cartouche. Part two. Louis Dominique Cartouche. Of all the heroes who have waged a private and undeclared war upon their neighbours, Louis Dominique Cartouche was the most generously endowed. It was but his resolute contempt for politics, his unswerving love of plunder for its own sake, that prevented him from seizing a throne or questing after the empire of the world. The modesty of his ambition sets him below Caesar or Napoleon, but he yields to neither in the genius of success. Whatever he would attain was his on the instant, nor did failure interrupt his career until treachery, of which he went in perpetual terror, involved himself and his comrades in ruin. His talent of generalship was unrivalled. None of the gang was permitted the liberty of a freelance. By Cartouche was the order given, and so long as the chief was in repose, Paris might enjoy her sleep. When it pleased him to join battle, a whistle was enough. Now it was revealed to his intelligence that the professional thief, who devoted all his days and such of his nights as were spared from depredation to wine and women, was more readily detected than the valet de chambre, who did but crack a crib or cry stand and deliver on a proper occasion. Wherefore he bade his soldiers take service in the great houses of Paris, that secure of suspicion they might still be ready to obey the call of duty. Thus also they formed a reconnoitring force, whose vigilance no prize might elude. And nowhere did Cartouche display his genius to finer purpose than in this prudent disposition of his army. It remained only to efface himself, and therein he succeeded admirably, by never sleeping two following nights in the same house, so that when Cartouche was the terror of Paris, when even the king trembled in his bed, none knew his stature, nor could recognise his features. In this shifting and impersonal visard he broke houses, pickpockets, robbed on the pad. One night he would terrify the Faubourg Saint-Germain, another he would plunder the humbler suburb of St. Antoine. But on each excursion he was companioned by experts, and the map of Paris was rigidly apportioned among his followers. To each district a captain was appointed, whose business it was to apprehend the customs of the quarter, and thus to indicate the proper season of attack. Ever triumphant, with yellow boys ever jingling in his pocket, Cartouche lived a life of luxurious merriment. A favourite haunt was a cabaret in the Rue Dauphine, chosen for the sanest of reasons, as his captain Ferrand declared, that the landlady was a femme d'esprit. Here he would sit with his friends and his women, and thereafter drive his chariot across the Pont Neuf to the sunnier gaiety of the Palais Royal. A finished dandy, he wore by preference a grey-white coat with silver buttons. His breeches and stockings were on a famous occasion of black silk, while a sword, scabbarded in satin, hung at his hip. But if Cartouche, like many another great man, had the faculty of enjoyment, if he loved wine and wit, and mistresses handsomely attired in damask, he did not therefore neglect his art. When once the gang was perfectly ordered, murder followed robbery with so instant a frequency that Paris was panic-stricken. A cry of Cartouche straightway ensured an empty street. The king took counsel with his ministers. Munificent rewards were offered without effect. The thief was still at work in all security, and it was a pretty irony which urged him to strip and kill on the highway one of the king's own pages. Also he did his work with so astonishing a silence, with so reasoned a certainty, that it seemed impossible to take him or his minions red-handed. Before all, he discouraged the use of firearms. A pistol, his philosophy urged, is an excellent weapon in an emergency, but reserve it for emergencies. At close quarters it is none too sure, and why give the alarm against yourself? Therefore he armed his band with loaded staves, which sent their enemies into a noiseless and fatal sleep. 
Thus he was wont to laugh at the police, deeming capture a plain impossibility. The traitor, in sooth, was his single irremediable fear, and if ever suspicion was aroused against a member of the gang, that member was put to death with the shortest shrift. It happened in the last year of Cartouche's supremacy that a lily-livered comrade fell in love with a pretty dressmaker. The indiscretion was the less pardonable since the dressmaker had a horror of theft and impudently tried to turn her lover from his trade. Cartouche, discovering the backslider, resolved upon a public exhibition. Before the assembled band he charged the miscreant with treason, and cutting his throat disfigured his face beyond recognition. Thereafter he pinned to the course the following inscription that others might be warned by so monstrous an example. Si Guijon rebati, qui a eul le traitement qui merite, ceux qui en feront autant que lui peuvent attendre le même sort. Yet this was the murder that led to the hero's own capture and death. Du Châtelet, another craven, had already aroused the suspicions of his landlady, who, finding him somewhat troubled the day after the traitor's death, and detecting a spot of blood on his neckerchief, questioned him closely. The coward, fumbling at an answer, she was presently convinced of his guilt, and forthwith denounced him for a member of the gang to M. Pacombe, an officer of the guard. Straightly did M. Pacombe summon to Châtelet, and, assuming his guilt for certitude, bade him surrender his captain. "'My friend,' said he, "'I know you for an associate of Cartouche. Your hands are soiled with murder and rapine. Confess the hiding-place of Cartouche, or in twenty-four hours you are broken on the wheel.' Vainly did Du Châtelet protest his ignorance. M. Pacombe was resolute, and before the interview was over, the robber confessed that Cartouche had given him rendezvous at nine next day. In the grey morning, thirty soldiers crept forth, guided by the traitor, en habit de bourgeois et de chasseur, for the house where Cartouche had lain. It was an inn kept by one Savard near La haute borne de la Cotille, and the soldiers, though they lacked not numbers, approached the chieftain's lair, shaking with terror. In front marched Du Châtelet. The rest followed in Indian file, ten paces apart. When the traitor reached the house, Savard recognised him for a friend, and entertained him with familiar speech. "'Is there anybody upstairs?' demanded Du Châtelet. "'No,' replied Savard. "'Are the four women upstairs?' asked Du Châtelet again. "'Yes, they are,' came the answer, for Savard knew the password of the day. Instantly the soldiers filled the tavern and mounting the staircase, discovered Cartouche with his three lieutenants, Bellani, Nimazin, and Blanchard. One of the four still lay abed, but Cartouche, with all the dandy's respect for his clothes, was mending his breeches. The others hugged a flagon of wine over the fire. So fell the scourge of Paris into the grip of justice, but once under lock and key he displayed all the qualities which made him supreme. His gaiety broke forth into a light-hearted contempt of his jailers, and the lieutenant criminel who would interrogate him was covered with ridicule. Not for an instant did he bow to fate. All shackled as he was, his legs engarlanded in heavy chains, which he called his garters, he tampered his merriment with the meditation of escape. From the first he denied all knowledge of Cartouche, insisting that his name was Charles Bourguignon, and demanding Burgundy that he might drink to his country, and thus prove him a true son of the soil. Not even the presence of his mother and brother abashed him. He laughed them away as impostors, hired by a false justice to accuse and to betray the innocent. No word of confession crossed his lips, and he would still entertain the officers of the law with joke and epigram. Thus he won over a handful of the guard, and begging for solitude, he straightway set about escape, with a courage and an address which Jack Shepherd might have envied. His delicate ear discovered that a cellar lay beneath his cell, and with the old nail which lies on the floor of every prison, he made his way downwards into a boxmaker's shop. 
but a barking dog spoiled the enterprise. The boxmaker and his daughter were immediately abroad, and once more Cartouche was lodged in prison, weighted with still heavier garters. Then came a period of splendid notoriety. He held his court, he gave an easy rein to his wit. He received duchesses and princes with an air of amiable patronage. Few there were of his visitants who left him without a present of gold, and thus the universal robber was further rewarded by his victims. His portrait hung in every house, and his thin, hard face, his dry, small features, were at last familiar to the whole of France. Monsieur Granval made him the hero of an epic, Le Vice Puni. Even the theatre was dominated by his presence, and while Alicard Cartouche was greeted with thunders of applause at the Italien, the more serious Francais set Cartouche upon the stage in three acts, and lavished upon its theme the resources of a then intelligent art. Monsieur Le Grand, author of the piece, deigned to call upon the King of Thieves, spoke some words of Argo with him, and by way of conscience money gave him a hundred crowns. Cartouche set little store by such patronage. He pocketed the crowns, and then put an end to the comedy by threatening that if it were played again the companions of Cartouche would punish all such miscreants as dared to make him a laughing-stock. For Cartouche would endure ridicule at no man's hand. At the very instant of his arrest, all barefooted as he was, he kicked a constable who presumed to smile at his discomfiture. His last days were spent in resolute abandonment. True, he once attempted to beat out his brains with the fetters that bound him. True, also, he took a poison that had been secretly conveyed within the prison. But both attempts failed, and more scrupulously watched, he had no other course than jollity. Lawyers and priests he visited with a like and bitter scorn, and when on November the 27th, 1721, he was led to the scaffold, not a word of confession or contrition had been dragged from him. To the last moment he cherished the hope of rescue, and eagerly he scanned the crowd for the faces of his comrades. But the gang, trusting to its leader's nobility, had broken its oath. With contemptuous dignity, Cartouche determined upon revenge. Proudly he turned to the priest, begging a respite and the opportunity of speech. Forgotten by his friends, he resolved to spare no single soul. He betrayed even his mistresses to justice. Of his gang, forty were in the service of Mademoiselle de Montpensier, who was already in Spain, while two obeyed the Duchesse de Ventador as valet de Pied. His confession, in brief, was so dangerous a document, it betrayed the friends and servants of so many great houses that the officers of the law found safety for their patrons in its destruction, and not a line of the hero's testimony remains. The trial of his comrades dragged on for many a year, and after Cartouche had been cruelly broken on the wheel, not a few of the gang, of which he had been at once the terror and inspiration, suffered a like fate. Such the career, and such the fitting end, of the most distinguished marauder the world has ever known. Thackeray, with no better guide than a chapbook, was minded to belittle him, now habiting him like a scullion, now sending him forth on some petty errand of cly-faking. But for all Thackeray's contempt, his fame is still undimmed, and he has left the reputation of one who, as thief unrivalled, had scarce his equal as wit and dandy, even in the days when Louis the Magnificent was still a memory and an example. End of section 12《Section Thirteen of A Book of Scoundrels by Charles Wibley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shepherd and Cartouche, Part Three, A Parallel. If the seventeenth century was the golden age of the high Toby man, it was at the advent of the eighteenth that the burglar and street robber plied their trade with the most distinguished success and it was the good fortune of both Cartouche and Shepherd to be born in the nick of time. Rivals in talent, they were also near contemporaries. 
and the scourge of Paris may well have been famous in the purlieu of Clare Market before Jack the Slipstring paid the last penalty of his crimes. As each of these great men harboured a similar ambition, so their careers are closely parallel. Born in a humble rank of life, Jack, like Cartouche, was the architect of his own fortune. Jack, like Cartouche, lived to be flattered by noble dames and to claim the solicitude of his sovereign, and each owed his preeminence rather to natural genius than to a sympathetic training. But for all the Britons' artistry, the Frenchman was in all points save one the superior. Shepherd's brain carried him not beyond the wants of today and the extortions of Paul Maggot. Who knows but he might have been a respectable citizen, with never a chance for the display of his peculiar talent, had not hunger and his mistress's greed driven him upon the pad. History records no brilliant robbery of his own planning, and so circumscribed was his imagination that he must needs pick out his own friends and benefactors for depredation. His paltry sense of discipline permitted him to be betrayed even by his brother and pupil, and there was no cracksman of his time over whose head he held the rod of terror. Even his hatred of Jonathan Wilde was the result not of policy but of prejudice. Cartouche, on the other hand, was always perfect when at work. The master of himself, he was also the master of his fellows. There was no detail of civil war that he had not made his own, and he still remains, after nearly two centuries, the greatest captain the world has seen. Never did he permit an enterprise to fail by accident. Never was he impelled by hunger or improvidence to fight a battle unprepared. His means were always neatly fitted to their end, as is proved by the truth that, throughout his career, he was arrested but once, and then not by his own inadvertence, but by the treachery of others. Yet from the moment of arrest Jack Shepherd asserted his magnificent superiority. If Cartouche was a sorry bungler at prison-breaking, Shepherd was unmatched in this dangerous art. The sport of the one was to break in, of the other to break out. True, the Briton proved his inferiority by too frequently placing himself under lock and key, but you will forgive his every weakness for the unexampled skill wherewith he extricated himself from the stubbornest dungeon. Cartouche would scarce have given Shepherd a menial's office in his gang. How cordially Shepherd would have despised Cartouche's solitary experiment in escape! To be foiled by a dog and a boxmaker's daughter! Would not that have seemed contemptible to the master-breaker of those unnumbered doors and walls which separated the castle from the freedom of Newgate Roof? Such, then, is the contrast between the heroes. Shepherd claims our admiration for one masterpiece. Cartouche has a sheaf of works which shall carry him triumphantly to the remotest future. And when you forget a while professional rivalry, and consider the delicacies of leisure, you will find the Frenchman's greatness still indisputable. At all points he was the prettier gentleman. Shepherd, to be sure, had a sense of finery, but he was so unused to grandeur that vulgarity always spoiled his effects. When he hired him from the pawn-shop laden with booty, he must e'en cram what he could not wear into his pockets and doubtless his vulgar lack of reticence made detection easier. Cartouche, on the other hand, had an unfailing sense of proportion, and was never more dressed than became the perfect dandy. He was elegant, he was polished, he was joyous. He drank wine while the other soaked himself in beer. He despised whatever was common, while his rival knew but the coarser flavours of life. The one was distinguished by a boisterous humour a swaggering pride in his own prowess. The wit of the other might be edged like a knife, nor would he ever appeal for a spectacle to the curiosity of the mob. Both were men of many mistresses, but again in his conduct with women Cartouche showed an honester talent. Shepherd was at once the prey and the whipping-block of his two infamous doxies, who agreed in deformity of feature as in contempt for their lover. Cartouche, on the other hand, chose his cabaret for the wit of its patron, 
and was always happy in the elegance and accomplishment of his companions. One point of likeness remains. The two heroes resembled each other not only in their profession, but in their person. Though their trade demanded physical strength, each was small and slender of build. A little slight-limbed lad, says the historian of Shepherd. A thin spare frame, sings the poet of Cartouche. Here, then, neither had the advantage. And if in the shades Cartouche despises the clumsiness and vulgarity of his rival, Shepherd may still remember the glory of Newgate, and twit the Frenchman with the barking of the boxmaker's dog. But genius is the talent of the dead, and the wise who are not partisans will not deny to the one or to the other the possession of the rarer gift. End of section 13section number 14 of a book of scoundrels by charles wibley this librivox recording is in the public domain fox to haggart who babbled on the castle rock of willy wallace and was only 19 when he danced without the music to sims alias gentleman harry who showed at tyburn how a hero could die to george barrington the incomparably witty and adroit, to these a full meed of honour has been paid. Even the coarse and dastardy Freni has achieved with Thackeray's aid and levers something of a reputation. But James Hardy Vox, despite his eloquent bid for fame, has not found his rhapsodist. Yet a more consistent ruffian never pleaded for mercy. From his early youth, until in 1819 he sent forth his memoirs to the world, he lived industriously upon the cross. There was no racket but he worked it with energy and address. Though he practised the more glorious crafts of pickpocket and shoplifter, he did not despise the begging letter, and he suffered his last punishment for receiving what another's courage had conveyed. His enterprise was not seldom rewarded with success and for a decade of years he continued to preserve an appearance of gentility. But it is plain, even from his own narrative, that he was scarce an artist, and we shall best understand him if we recognise that he was a Philistine among thieves. He lived in an age of pocket-picking, and skill in this branch is the true test of his time. A contemporary of Barrington, he had before him the most brilliant of examples which might properly have enforced the worth of a simple method. But though he constantly brags of his success at Drury Lane, we take not his generalities for gospel, and the one exploit whose credibility is enforced with circumstance was pitiful both in conception and performance. A meeting of freeholders at the Mermaid Tavern Hackney was the occasion, and after drawing blank upon blank, Fox succeeded at last in extracting a silver snuff-box. Now his clumsiness had suggested the use of the scissors, and the victim not only discovered the scission in his coat, but caught the thief with the implements of his art upon him. By a miracle of impudence, Fox escaped conviction, but he deserved the gallows for his want of principle, and not even sympathy could have let drop a tear had justice seized her due. On the straight or on the cross, the canons of art deserve respect, and a thief is great not because he is a thief, but because in filling his own pocket he preserves from violence the legitimate traditions of his craft. But it was in conflict with the jewellers that Vox best proved his mettle. It was his wont to clothe himself in the most elegant attire, and on the pretence of purchase to rifle the shops of Piccadilly. For this offence, pinching the cant dictionary calls it, he did his longest stretch of time, and here his admirable qualities of cunning and coolness found their most generous scope. A love of fine clothes he shared with all the best of his kind, and he visited Mr. Bilger, the jeweller who arrested him, magnificently arrayed. He wore a black coat and waistcoat, blue pantaloons, hessian boots, and a hat in the extreme of the newest fashion. He was also resplendent with gold watch and eyeglass, his hair was powdered, and a fawny sparkled on his dexter fam. 
The booty was enormous, and a week later he revisited the shop on another errand. This second visit was the one flash of genius in a somewhat drab career. The jeweller was so completely dumbfounded that Vox might have got clean away, but though he kept discreetly out of sight for a while, at last he drifted back to his ancient boozing ken, and was there betrayed to a notorious thief-catcher. The inevitable sentence of death followed. It was commuted after the fashion of the time, and Vox, having sojourned a while at the hulks, sought for a second time the genial airs of Botany Bay. His vanity and his laziness were alike invincible. He believed himself a miracle of learning as well as a perfect thief, and physical toil was the sole lay for which he professed no capacity. For a while he corrected the press for a printer, and he roundly asserts that his knowledge of literature and of foreign tongues rendered him invaluable. It was vanity again that induced him to assert his innocence, when he was lagged for so vulgar a crime as stealing a wipe from a tradesman in Chancery Lane. At the moment of arrest he was on his way to purchase base coin from a Whitechapel bitfaker, but despite his nefarious errand he is righteously wrathful at what he asserts was an unjust conviction, and henceforth he assumed the crown of martyrdom. His first and last ambition during the intervals of freedom was gentility, and so long as he was not at work he lived the life of a respectable grocer. Although the casual Cyprian flits across his page, he pursued the one flame of his life for the good motive, and he affects to be a very model of domesticity. The sentiment of piety also was strong upon him, and if he did not, like the illustrious Peace, pray for his jailer, he rivalled the prison ordinary in comforting the condemned. Had it only been his fate to die on the gallows, how unctuous had been his croak! The text of his memoirs having been edited, it is scarce possible to define his literary talent. The book as it stands is an excellent piece of narrative, but it loses somewhat by the pretense of style. The man's invulnerable conceit prevented an absolute frankness, and there is little enough hilarity to correct the acid sentiment and the intolerable vows of repentance. Again, though he knows his subject and can pat a flash with the best, his incorrigible respectability leads him to ape the manner of a Grub Street hack, and to banish to a vocabulary those pearls of slang which might have added vigour and lustre to his somewhat tiresome page. However, the thief cannot escape his inevitable defects. The vanity, the weakness, the sentimentality of those who are born beasts of prey, yet have the faculty of depredation only half developed, are the foes of truth, and it is well to remember that the autobiography of a rascal is tainted at its source. A congenial pickpocket, equipped with the self-knowledge and the candour which would enable him to recognise himself an outlaw, and justice his enemy rather than an instrument of malice, would prove a Napoleon rather than a Vox so that we must e'en accept our Newgate calendar with its many faults upon its head, and be content. For it takes a man of genius to write a book, and the thief who turns author commonly inhabits a paradise of the second rate. End of section 14section 15 of A Book of Scoundrels by Charles Wibley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. George Barrington As Captain Hind was master of the road, George Barrington was, and remains for ever, the absolute monarch of pickpockets. Though the art, superseding the cutting of purses, had been practised with courage and address for half a century before Barrington saw the light, it was his own incomparable genius that raised thievery from the dangerous valley of experiment, and set it secure and honoured upon the mountain height of perfection. To a natural habit of depredation, which being a man of letters he was wont to justify, he added a sureness of hand, a fertility of resource, a recklessness of courage, which drove his contemporaries to an amazed respect, and from which none but the Philistine will withhold his admiration. An accident discovered his taste and talent. 
At school he attempted to kill a companion, the one act of violence which sullies a strangely gentle career, and, outraged at the affront of a flogging, he fled with twelve guineas and a gold repeater watch. A vulgar theft this, and no presage of future greatness, yet it proves the fearless greed, the contempt of private property, which mark, as with a stigma, the temperament of the prig. His faculty did not rust long for lack of use, and at Drogheda, when he was but sixteen, he encountered one price, half barnstormer, half thief. Forthwith he embraced the twin professions, and in the interlude of more serious pursuits is reported to have made a respectable appearance as Jaffier in Venice Preserved. For a while he dreamed of Drury Lane and glory, but an attachment for Miss Edgerton, the Belvedere to his own Jaffier, was more costly than the barns of Londonderry warranted, and with price for a colleague he set forth on a tour of robbery, merely interrupted through twenty years by a few periods of enforced leisure. His youth, indeed, was his golden age. For four years he practised his art, chilled by no shadow of suspicion, and his immunity was due as well to his excellent bearing as to his sleight of hand. In one of the countless chapbooks which dishonour his fame, he is unjustly accused of relying for his effects upon an elaborate apparatus, half knife, half scissors, wherewith to rip the pockets of his victims. The mere backbiting of envy! An artistic triumph was never won save by legitimate means, and the hero who plundered the dulce of L at Ranoni, who emptied the pockets of his acquaintance without fear of exposure, who all but carried off the priceless snuff-box of Count Orloff, most assuredly followed his craft in full simplicity, and with a proper scorn of clumsy artifice. At his first appearance he was the master, sumptuously apparelled, with price for valet. At Dublin his birth and quality were never questioned, and when he made a descent upon London it was in company with Captain W. H., who remained for years his loyal friend. He visited Brighton as the chosen companion of Lord Ferrers and the wicked Lord Littleton. His manners and learning were alike irresistible. Though the picking of pockets was the art and interest of his life, he was on terms of easy familiarity with light literature, and he considered no toil too wearisome if only his conversation might dazzle his victims. Two maxims he charactered upon his heart. The one, never to run a large risk for a small gain. The other, never to forget the carriage and diction of a gentleman. He never stooped to pilfer until exposure and decay had weakened his hand. In his first week at Dublin he carried off a thousand pounds, and it was only his faithful interview with Sir John Fielding that gave him poverty for a bedfellow. Even at the end, when he slunk from town to town, a notorious outlaw, he had inspirations of his ancient magnificence, and, at Chester, he eluded the vigilance of his enemies and captured six hundred pounds, wherewith he purchased some months of respectability. Now respectability was ever dear to him, and it was at once his pleasure and profit to live in the highest society. Were it not blasphemy to Sally Barrington with slang, you would call him a member of the swell mob, but having cultivated a grave and sober style for himself, he recoiled in horror from the flash lingo, and his susceptibility demands respect. He kept a commonplace book. Was ever such thrift in a thief? Whatever images or thoughts flashed through his brain, he seized them on paper, even amidst the jollity of a tavern or in the warmth of an interesting conversation. Was it then strange that he triumphed as a man of fashionable and cultured leisure? He would visit Ranelagh with the most distinguished, and turn a while from epigram and jest to empty the pocket of a rich acquaintance. And ever with so tactful a certainty, with so fine a restraint of the emotions, that suspicion was preposterous. To catalogue his exploits is superfluous, yet let it be recorded that once he went to court, habited as a clergyman, and came home the richer for a diamond order, Lord C.'s proudest decoration. Even the assault upon Prince Orloff was nobly planned. Barrington had precise intelligence of the marvellous snuff-box, 
the Empress's own gift to her lover. He knew also how he might meet the Prince at Drury Lane. He had even discovered that the Prince, for safety, hid the jewel in his vest. But the Prince felt the prig's hand upon the treasure, and gave an instant alarm. Overconfidence, maybe, or a too liberal dinner, was the cause of failure, and Barrington, surrounded in a moment, was speedily in the lock-up. It was the first rebuff that the hero had received, and straight away his tact and ingenuity left him. The evidence was faulty, the prosecution declined, and naught was necessary for escape save presence of mind. Even friends were staunch, and had Barrington told his customary lie, his character had gone unsullied. Yet having posed for his friends as a student of the law, at Bow Street he must needs declare himself a doctor, and the needless discrepancy ruined him. Though he escaped the gallows, there was an end to the diversions of intellect and fashion, as he discovered when he visited the House of Lords to hear an appeal, and Black Rod ejected him at the persuasion of Mr. G. As yet unused to insult, he threatened violence against the aggressor and finding no bail, he was sent on his first imprisonment to the Bridewell in Tothill Fields. Rapid indeed was the descent. At the first grip of adversity he forgot his cherished principles, and two years later the loftiest and most elegant gentleman that ever picked a pocket was at the Hulks, for robbing a harlot at Drury Lane. Henceforth his insolence and artistry declined, and though to the last there were intervals of grandeur, he spent the better part of fifteen years in the commission of crimes whose very littleness condemned them. At last, an exile from St. James's and Ranelagh, he was forced into a society which still further degraded him. Hitherto he had shunned the society of professed thieves. In his golden youth he had scorned to shelter him in the flash kens which were the natural harbours of pickpockets. But now, says his biographer, he began to seek evil company, and the victim of his own fame found safety only in obscene concealment. At the hulks he recovered something of his dignity, and discretion rendered his first visit brief enough. Even when he was committed on a second offence, and had attempted suicide, he was still irresistible, and he was discharged with several years of imprisonment to run but in truth he was born for honour and distinction, and common actions, common criminals, were in the end distasteful to him. In his heyday he stooped no further than to employ such fences as might profitably dispose of his booty, and the two partners of his misdeeds were both remarkable. James, the earlier accomplice, affected clerical attire, and in 1791 was living in a Westphalian monastery, to which he some years ago retired, in an enviable state of peace and penitence, respected for his talents, and loved for his amiable manners, by which he is distinguished in an eminent degree. The other ruffian, Low by name, was known to his own Bloomsbury Square for a philanthropic and cultured gentleman, yet only suicide saved him from the gallows. And while Barrington was wise in the choice of his servant, his manners drove even strangers to admiration. Policemen and prisoners were alike anxious to do him honour. Once, when he needed money for his own defence, his brother thieves, whom he had ever shunned and despised, collected a hundred pounds for the captain of their guild. Nor did jailer and judge ever forget the respect due to a gentleman. When Barrington was tried and condemned for the theft of Mr. Townend's watch at Enfield Races, September the 15th, 1790, was the day of his last transgression. One knows not which was the more eloquent in his respect, the judge or the culprit. But it was not until the pickpocket set out for Botany Bay that he took full advantage of his gentlemanly bearing. To thrust Mr. Barrington into the hold was plainly impossible, even though transportation for seven years was his punishment. Wherefore he was admitted to the boatswain's mess, was allowed as much baggage as a first-class passenger, and doubtless beguiled the voyage, for others, with the information of a well-stored mind. By an inspiration of luck he checked a mutiny, 
holding the quarter-deck against a mob of ruffians with no weapons but a marlin-spike. And hereafter, he tells you in his voyage to New South Wales, he was accorded the fullest liberty to come or go. He visited many a foreign port with the officers of the ship. He packed a hundred notebooks with trite and superfluous observations. He posed, in brief, as the captain of the ship without responsibility. Arrived at Port Jackson, he was acclaimed a hero, and received with obsequious solicitude by the governor, who promised that his future situation should be such as would render his banishment from England as little irksome as possible. Forthwith he was appointed High Constable of Parramatta, and, like Vautrin, who might have taken the youthful Barrington for another Rastignac, he ended his days the honourable custodian of less fortunate convicts, or, as a broadside ballad has it, he left old Drury's flash purlieus to turn at last a copper. Never did he revert to his ancient practice. If in his youth he had lived the double life with an effrontery and elegance which Brodie himself never attained, henceforth his career was single in its innocence. He became a prig in the less harmful and more offensive sense. After the orthodox fashion, he endeared himself to all who knew him, and ruled Parramatta with an equable severity. Having cultivated the humanities for the base purposes of his trade, he now devoted himself to literature with an energy of dullness, becoming, as it were, a liberal education personified. His earlier efforts had been in verse, and you wonder that no enterprising publisher had ventured on a limited edition. Time was he composed an ode to light, and once, recovering from a fever contracted at Ballyshannon, he addressed a few burning lines to Hygeia. Hygeia, thou whose eyes display the lustre of meridian day, and so on for endless couplets. Then had he not celebrated in immortal verse his love for Miss Edgerton, untimely drowned in the waters of the Boyne, but now, as became the constable of Parramatta, he chose the sterner medium, and followed up his voyage to New South Wales with several exceeding trite and valuable histories. His most ambitious work was dedicated in periods of unctuous piety to His Majesty King George the Third, and the book's first sentence is characteristic of his method and sensibility. In contemplating the origin, rise, and fall of nations, the mind is alternately filled with a mixture of sacred pain and pleasure. Would you read further? Then you will find Fauna and Flora, twin goddesses of ineptitude, flitting across the page, unreadable as a geographical treatise. His first masterpiece was translated into French, Anno VI, and the translator apologises that war with England alone prevents the compilation of a suitable biography. Was ever thief treated with so grave a consideration? Then another work was prefaced by the Right Honourable William Eden, and all were embellished with beautiful coloured plates, and ran through several editions. Only once did he return to poetry, the favoured medium of his youth, and he returned to write an imperishable line. Even then his pedantry persuaded him to renounce the authorship and to disparage the achievement. The occasion was the opening of a theatre at Sydney, wherein the parts were sustained by convicts. The cost of admission to the gallery was one shilling, paid in money, flour, meat, or spirits. The play was entitled The Revenge and the Hotel, and Barrington provided the prologue, which for one passage is for ever memorable. Thus it runs. From distant climes or widespread seas we come, though not with much eclat or beat of drum. True patriots we, for be it understood, we left our country for our country's good. No private views disgraced our generous zeal. What urged our travels was our country's weal. And none will doubt but that our emigration has proved most useful to the British nation. We left our country for our country's good. That line, thrown fortuitously into four hundred pages of solid prose, has emerged to become the common possession of Fleet Street. 
it is the man's one title to literary fame. For spurning the thievish practice he knew so well, he was righteously indignant when the London spy was fathered upon him. Though he emptied his contemporaries' pockets of many thousands, he enriched the dictionary of quotations with one line, which will be repeated so long as there is human hand to wield a pen. And if the High Constable of Parramatta was tediously respectable, George Barrington the Prig was a man of genius. End of section 15section 16 of a book of scoundrels by charles wibley this librivox recording is in the public domain the switcher and gentleman harry part 1 the switcher david haggart was born at cannon mills with no richer birthright than thievish fingers and a left hand of surpassing activity the son of a gamekeeper he grew up a long-legged, red-headed callant, lurking in the sombre shadow of the cowgate, or, like the young Sir Walter, championing the old town against the new, on the slopes of Arthur's seat. Kipping was his early sin, but the sportsman's instinct, born of his father's trade, was so strong with him that he pinched a fighting cock before he was breached, and risked the noose for horse-stealing when marbles should have engrossed his boyish fancy. Turbulent and lawless, he bitterly resented the intolerable restraint of a tranquil life, and at last, in the hope of a larger liberty, he enlisted for a drummer in the Norfolk Militia, stationed at the moment in Edinburgh Castle. A brief insubordinate year, misspent in his country's service, proved him hopeless of discipline. He claimed his discharge and henceforth he was free to follow the one craft for which nature and his own ambition had moulded him. Like Chatterton, like Rimbaud, Haggart came into the full possession of his talent while still a child. A Barrington of fourteen, he knew every turn and twist of his craft before he escaped from school. His youthful necessities were munificently supplied by facile depredation and the only hindrance to immediate riches was his ignorance of flash kens where he might fence his plunder. Meanwhile he painted his soul black with wickedness. Such hours as he could snatch from the profitable conduct of his trade he devoted to the austere debauchery of Leith or the Golden Acre. Though he knew not the seduction of whisky, he missed never a dance nor a raffle joining the frolics of prigs and callets in complete forgetfulness of the shorter catechism. In vain the kirk compared him to a bottle in the smoke. In vain the minister whispered of hell and the gallows. His heart hardened as his fingers grew agile, and when at sixteen he left his father's house for a sporting life, he had not his equal in the three kingdoms for cunning and courage. His first accomplice was Barney Maguire, who, until a fourteen stretch sent him to Botany Bay, played Clytus to David's Alexander, and it was at Portobello Races that their brilliant partnership began. Hitherto Haggart had worked by stealth. He had tracked his booty under the cloud of night. Now was the moment to prove his prowess in the eye of day, to break with a past which he already deemed ignoble. His heart leaped with the occasion. He tackled his adventure with the hot-head energy of a new member, big with his maiden speech. The victim was chosen in an instant, a backer whose good fortune had broken the bookmakers. There was no thief on the course who did not wait in hungry appetence the sportsman's descent from the stand. Yet the novice outstripped them all. "'I got the first dive at his keek cloy he writes in his simple heroic style and was so eager on my prey that I pulled out the pocket along with the money, and nearly upset the gentleman. A steady brain saved him from the consequence of an o'er-buoyant enthusiasm. The notes were passed to Barney in a flash, and when the sportsman turned upon his assailant, Haggart's hands were empty. Thereupon followed an infinite series of brilliant exploits. With Barney to aid, he plundered the border like a reaver 
he stripped the yeoman of Tweedside with a ferocity which should have avenged the disgrace of Flodden. More than once he ransacked Ecclefechan, though it is unlikely that he emptied the lean pocket of Thomas Carlyle. There was not a gaff from Newcastle to the Tay which he did not haunt with sedulous perseverance. Nor was he confronted with failure, until his figure became a universal terror. His common method was to price a horse, and while the dealer showed Barney the animal's teeth, Haggart would slip under the uplifted arm and ease the blockhead of his blunt. Arrogant in his skill, delighted with his manifold triumphs, Haggart led a life of unbroken prosperity under the brisk air of heaven, and despite the risk of his profession, he remained two years a stranger to poverty and imprisonment. His worst mishap was to slip his forks into an empty pocket, or to encounter in his cups a milvardering horse-dealer. But his joys were free and frank, while he exulted in his success with a boyish glee. "'I was never happier in all my life than when I fingered all this money,' he exclaimed when he had captured the comfortable prize of two hundred pounds. And then he would make merry at Newcastle or York, forgetting the knowing ones for a while, going abroad in white cape and tops, and flicking his leg like a gentleman with a dandy whip. But at last Barney and a wayward ambition persuaded him to desert his proper craft for the greater hazard of cracking a crib, and thus he was involved in his ultimate ruin. He incurred, and he deserved, the untoward fate of those who overlook their talent's limitation. And when this master of pickpocket followed Barney through the window of a secluded house upon the York Road, he might already have felt the noose tightening at his neck. The immediate reward of this bungled attack was thirty pounds. But two days later he was committed with Barney to the Durham Assizes, where he exchanged the obscurity of the perfect craftsman for the notoriety of the dangerous jailbird. For the moment, however, he recovered his freedom. Breaking prison, he straightway conveyed a fiddlestick to his comrade, and in a twinkling was at Newcastle again, picking up purses well lined with gold, and robbing the bumpkins of their scouts and chats. But the time of security was overpast. Marked and suspicious, he began to fear the solitude of the country. He left the horse fair for the city, and sought in the budging kens of Edinburgh the secrecy impossible on the hillside. A clumsy experiment in shoplifting doubled his danger, and more than once he saw the inside of the police office. Henceforth he was free of the family. He loafed in the Shira Bray. He knew the flash houses of Leith and the grass market. With Jean Johnson, the blowen of his choice, he smeared his hands with the squalor of petty theft. And the drunken recklessness wherewith he swaggered his abroad hastened his approaching downfall. With a perpetual anxiety to avoid the nippers, his artistry dwindled. The left hand, invincible on the cheviots, seemed no better than a bunch of thumbs in the narrow ways of Edinburgh, and after innumerable misadventures, Haggart was safely lodged in Dumfries jail. No sooner was he locked within his cell than his restless brain planned a generous escape. He would win liberty for his fellows as well as for himself and after a brief counsel a murderous plot was framed and executed. A stone slung in a handkerchief sent Morin the jailer to sleep. The keys found on him opened the massy doors, and Haggart was free, with a reward set upon his head. The shock of the enterprise restored his magnanimity. Never did he display a finer bravery than in this spirited race for his life, and though three counties were aroused, he doubled and ducked to such purpose that he outstripped John Richardson himself with all his bloodhounds, and two days later marched into Carlisle, disguised in the stolen rags of a potato bogle. During the few months that remained to him of life, he embarked upon a veritable odyssey. He scoured Scotland from the border to St. Andrews, and finally contrived a journey over sea to Ireland, where he made the name of Daniel O'Brien a terror to well-doers. Insolent and careless, he lurched from prison to prison. Now it was Armagh that held him, now down Patrick, until at last he was thrust on a general charge of vagabondage and ill company into Kilmainham, 
which has since harboured many a less valiant adventurer than David Haggart. Here the culminating disgrace overtook him. He was detected in the prison-yard by his ancient enemy, John Richardson of Dumfries, who dragged him back to Scotland heavily shackled and charged with murder. So nimble had he proved himself in extrication that his captors secured him with pitiless severity. Round his waist he carried an iron belt, where too were padlocked the chains, clanking at his wrists and ankles. Thus tortured and helpless, he was fed like a sucking turkey in bedlam. But his sorrows vanished, and his dying courage revived at sight of the torchlight procession which set forth from Dumfries to greet his return. His coach was hustled by a mob, thousand strong, eager to catch sight of Haggart the murderer, and though the spot where he slew Morin was like fire beneath his passing feet, he carried to his cell a heart and a brain aflame with gratified vanity. His guilt being patent, reprieve was as hopeless as acquittal, and after the assured condemnation he spent his last few days, with what profit he might, in religious and literary exercises. He composed a memoir, which is a model of its kind. So diligently did he make his soul that he could appear on the scaffold in a chastened spirit of prayerful gratitude. And being an eminent scoundrel, he seemed a proper subject for the ministrations of Mr. George Coombe. That is the one thing I did not know before, he confessed with an engaging modesty when his bumps were squeezed. And yet he was more than a match for the amiable phrenologist whose ignorance of mankind persuaded him to believe that an illiterate felon could know himself and analyse his character. His character escaped his critics as it escaped himself. Time was when George Borrow, that other picaroon, surprised the youthful David thinking of Willie Wallace upon the castle rock, and Lavengro's romantic memory transformed the raw-boned pickpocket into a monumental hero, who lacked nothing save a vast theatre to produce a vast effect. He was a Tamburlaine robbed of his opportunity, a valiant warrior who looked in vain for a battlefield, a marauder who climbed the scaffold, not for the magnitude, but for the littleness of his sins. Thus Borrow, in complete misunderstanding of the rascal's qualities. Now Hackett's ambition was as circumscribed as his ability. He died as he was born, an expert cliffaker whose achievements in sleight of hand are as yet unparalleled. Had the world been one vast breast-pocket, his fishhook fingers would have turned it inside out, but it was not his to mount a throne or overthrow a dynasty. My forks, he boasted, are equally long, and they never fail me. That is at once the reason and the justification of his triumph. Born with a consummate artistry tingling at his fingertips, how should he escape the compulsion of a glorious destiny? Without fumbling or failure, he discovered the single craft for which fortune had framed him, and he pursued it with a courage and an industry which gave him not a kingdom, but fame and booty, exceeding even his greedy aspiration. No Tamerlan he, questing for a continent, but David Haggart, the man with the long forks, happy if he snatched his neighbour's purse. Before all things, he respected the profession which his left hand made inevitable, and which he pursued with unconquerable pride. Nor in his inspired youth was plunder his sole ambition. He cultivated the garden of his style with the natural zeal of the artist. He frowned upon the bungler with a lofty contempt. His materials were simplicity itself, his forks, which were always with him, and another's well-filled pocket since sensible of danger he cared not to risk his neck for a purse that did not contain so much as would sweeten a grawler at its best his method was always witty that is the single word which will characterize it witty as a piece of highness prose and as dangerous he would run over a man's pockets while he spoke with him returning what he chose to discard without the lightest breath of suspicion a good workman his contemporaries called him and they thought it a shame for him to be idle. Moreover, he did not blunder unconsciously upon his triumph. He tackled the trade in so fine a spirit of analysis that he might have been the very Aristotle of his science. 
The keek cloy, he wrote in his hints to young sportsmen, is easily picked. If the notes are in the long fold, just tip them the forks. But if there is a purse or open money in the case, you must link it. The breast pocket, on the other hand, is a severer test. Picking the suck is sometimes a kittle job. Again the philosopher speaks. If the coat is buttoned, it must be opened by slipping past. Then bring the lil down between the flap of the coat and the body, keeping your spare arm across your man's breast, and so slip it to a comrade. Then abuse the fellow for jostling you. Not only did he master the tradition of thievery, he vaunted his originality with the familiar complacence of the scoundrel. Forgetting that it was by burglary that he was undone, he explains for his public glorification that he was wont to enter the houses of Leith by forcing the small window above the outer door. This artifice, his vanity grumbles, is now common, but he would have all the world understand that it was his own invention, and he murmurs with the pedantry of the convicted criminal that it is now set forth for the better protection of honest citizens. No less admirable in his own eyes was that other artifice, which induced him to conceal such notes as he managed to filch in the collar of his coat. Thus he eluded the vigilance of the police, which searched its prey in those days with a sorry lack of cunning. In truth, Haggart's wits were as nimble as his fingers, and he seldom failed to render a profitable account of his talents. He beguiled one of his sojourns in jail by manufacturing tinder wherewith to light the prisoner's pipes, and it is not astonishing that he won a general popularity. In Ireland, when the constables would take him for a Scot, he answered in high Tipperary, and saved his skin for a while by a brogue which would not have shamed a modern patriot. But quick as were his wits, his vanity always outstripped them, and no hero ever bragged of his achievements with a louder effrontery. Now all you ramblers in morning go, for the prince of ramblers is lying low. And all you maidens that love the game, put on your morning veils again. Thus he celebrated his downfall in a ballad that has the true Newgate ring. And verily in his own eyes he was a hero who carried to the scaffold a dauntless spirit unstained by treachery. He believed himself an adept in all the arts. As a squire of dames he held himself peerless, and he assured the ineffable Coombe, who recorded his flippant utterance with a credulous respect, that he had sacrificed hecatombs of innocent virgins to his importunate lust. Throes and verse trickled with equal faculty from his pen, and his biography is a masterpiece. Written in the peddler's French, as it was misspoken in the hells of Edinburgh, it is a narrative of uncommon simplicity and directness, marred now and again by such superfluous reflections as are the natural result of thievish sentimentality. He tells his tale without paraphrase or adornment, and the worthy writer to the signet who prepared the work for the press would have asked three times the space to record one half the adventures. I sunk upon it with my forks and brought it with me. We obtained thirty-three pounds by this affair. Is there not the stalwart flavour of the epic in these plain unvarnished sentences. His other accomplishments are pallid in the light of his brilliant left hand. Once, at Derry, he attended a cock-fight, and beguiled an interval by emptying the pockets of a lucky bookmaker. An expert who watched the exploit in admiration could not withhold a compliment. "'You are the switcher!' he exclaimed. "'Some take all, but you leave nothing.' And it is as the switcher that Haggart keeps his memory green. End of section 16。section 17 of a book of scoundrels by Charles Wibley。this librivox recording is in the public domain。the switcher and gentleman Harry。part 2 。Gentleman Harry. Damn you both! Stop, or I'll blow your brains out! Thus it was that Harry Sims greeted his victims, proving in a phrase that the heroic age of the rumpad was no more. 
forgotten the debonair courtesy of claude duval forgotten the lightning wit the swift repartee of the incomparable hind no longer was the high toby gloak a gentleman of the road he was a butcher if not a beggar on horseback a braggart without the courage to pull a trigger a swashbuckler oblivious of that ancient style which converted the misery of surrender into a privilege yet harry sims the supreme adventurer of his age was not without distinction his lithe form and his hard-ridden horse were the common dread of england his activity was rewarded with a princely treasure and if his method were lacking in urbanity the excuse is that he danced not to the brilliant measure of the cavaliers but limped to the clumsy fiddle-scraping of the early georges at eton where a too indulgent grandmother had placed him he ransacked the desks of his schoolfellows and avenged a birching by emptying his master's pockets wherefore he lost the hope of a polite education and instead of proceeding with a clerkly dignity to king's college in the university of cambridge he was ignominiously apprenticed to a breeches maker the one restraint was as irksome as the other and harry sims abandoned the needle as he had scorned the grammar to go upon the pad though his early companions were scragged at tyburn the light-fingered rascal was indifferent to their fate and squandering such booty as fell to his share he bravely turned out for more tottenham court fair was the theatre of his childish exploits and there he gained some little skill in the picking of pockets but a spell of bad trade brought him to poverty and he attempted to replenish an empty pocket by the childish expedient of a threatening letter the plan was conceived and executed with a futility which ensured an instant capture the bungler chose a stranger at haphazard commanding him under penalty of death to lay five guineas upon a gun in tower wharf the guineas were cunningly deposited and the rascal caught with his hand upon the booty was committed to newgate youth and the intercession of his grandmother procured a release unjustified by the infamous stupidity of the trick its very clumsiness should have sent him over sea and it is wonderful that from a beginning of so little promise he should have climbed even the first slopes of greatness however the memory of jail forced him to a brief interlude of honesty for a while he wore the pink coat of colonel cunningham's postilion and presently was promoted to the independence of a hackney coach thus employed he became acquainted with the famous cyprians of covent garden who loving him for his handsome face and sprightly gesture seduced him to desert his cab for an easier profession so long as the sky was fair he lived under their amiable protection but the summer having chased the smarter gentry from town the ladies could afford him no more than would purchase a horse and a pair of pistols so that harry was compelled to challenge fortune on the high road his first journey was triumphantly successful a post-chaise and a couple of coaches emptied their wealth into his hands and riding for london he was able to return the favours lavished upon him by covent garden at the first touch of gold he was transformed to a finished blade he purchased himself a silver-hilted sword which he dangled over a discreet suit of black velvet a prodigious run of luck at the gaming tables kept his purse well lined and he made so brilliant an appearance in his familiar haunts that he speedily gained the name of gentleman harry but the money lightly won was lightly spent the tables took back more than they gave and before long sims was astride his horse again flourishing his irons and crying stand and deliver upon every road in england epping forest was his general hunting ground but his enterprise took him far afield and if one night he galloped by starlight across bagshot heath another he was holding up the york stage with unbridled insolence he robbed he roared he blustered with praiseworthy industry and good luck coming to the aid of caution he escaped for a while the necessary punishment of his crimes it was on stockbridge downs that he met his first check he had stopped a chariot and came off with a hatful of gold but the victims impatient of disaster raised the county 
and Gentleman Harry was laid by the heels. Never at a loss, he condescended to a cringing hypocrisy. He whined, he whimpered, he babbled of reform, he plied his prosecutors with letters so packed with penitence that they abandoned their case. And in a couple of days, Sims had eased a collector at Eversley Bank of three hundred pounds. For this enterprise, two others climbed the gallows, and the robber's pride in his capture was miserably lessened by the shedding of innocent blood. But he forgot his remorse as speedily as he dissipated his money, and sentimentality neither damped his enjoyment nor restrained his energy. Even his brief visits to London were turned to the best account, and though he would have the world believe him a mere voluptuary, his eye was bent sternly upon business. If he did lose his money in a gambling hell, he knew who won it, and spoke with his opponent on the homeward way. In his eyes a fuddled rake was always fair game, and the stern windows of St. Clement's Church looked down upon many a profitable adventure. His most distinguished journey was to Ireland, whither he set forth to find a market for his stolen treasure. But he determined that the road should bear its own charges, and he reached Dublin a richer man than he left London. In three months he was penniless, but he did not begin trade again until he had recrossed the channel. And, having got to work near Chester, he returned to the piazza fat with banknotes. With success his extravagance increased and living the life of a man about town, he was soon harassed by debt. More than once he was lodged in the Marshalsea, and as his violent temper resented the interference of a dun, he became notorious for his assaults upon sheriff's officers. And thus his poor skill grew poorer. Forgetting his trade, he expected that brandy would ease his embarrassment. At last, sodden with drink, he enlisted in the guards, from which regiment he deserted, only to be pressed aboard a man of war. Freed by a clever trick, he took to the road again, until a paltry theft from a barber transported him to Maryland. There he turned sailor, and his ship, the two sisters, being taken by a privateer, he contrived to scramble into Portugal, whence he made his way back to England and to the only adventure of which he was master. He landed with no more money than the price of a pistol but he prigged a prancer at Bristol Horse Fair, and set out upon his last journey. The tide of his fortune was at flood. He crammed his pockets with watches. He was owner of enough diamonds to set up shop in a fashionable quarter. Of guineas he had as many as would support his magnificence for half a year, and at last he resolved to quit the road, and to live like the gentleman he was. To this prudence he was the more easily persuaded, because not only were the thief-takers eager for his capture, but he was a double-dyed deserter, whose sole chance of quietude was a decent obscurity. His resolution was taken at St. Albans, and over a comfortable dinner he pictured a serene and uneventful future. On the morrow he would set forth to Dublin, sell his handsome stock of jewels, and forget that the cart ever lumbered up Tyburn Hill. So elated was he with his growing virtue that he called for a second bottle, and as the port heated his blood his fingers tingled for action. A third bottle proved beyond dispute that only the craven were idle. And why, he exclaimed, generous with wine, should the most industrious ruffler of England condescend to inaction? Instantly he summoned the ostler, screaming for his horse, and before Redburn he had emptied four pockets, and had exchanged his own tired jade for a fresh and willing beast. Still exultant in his contempt of cowardice, he faced the Warrington stage, and made off with his plunder at a drunken gallop. Arrived at Dunstable, he was so befogged with liquor and pride that he entered the Bull Inn, the goal of the very coach he had just encountered. He had scarce called for a quartern of brandy when the robbed passengers thronged into the kitchen, and the fright gave him enough sobriety to leave his glass untasted and stagger to his horse. In a wild fury of arrogance and terror, of conflicting vice and virtue, he pressed on to Hockcliffe, where he took refuge from the rain, and presently, fuddled with more brandy, he fell asleep over the kitchen fire. 
By this time the hue and cry was raised, and as the hero lay helpless in the corner, three troopers burst into the inn, levelled their pistols at his head, and threatened death if he put his hand to his pocket. Half asleep and wholly drunk, he made not the smallest show of resistance. He surrendered all his money, watches, and diamonds, save a little that was sewn into his neckcloth, and sulkily crawled up to his bedchamber. Thither the troopers followed him, and having restored some nine pounds at his urgent demand, they watched his heavy slumbers. For all his brandy, Sims slept but uneasily, and awoke in the night sick with the remorse which is bred of ruined plans and a splitting head. He got up wearily, and sat over the fire, a good deal chagrined, to quote his own simple phrase, at his miserable capture. Escape seemed hopeless indeed. There crouched the vigilant troopers, scowling on their prey. A thousand plans chased each other through our hero's fuddled brain, and at last he resolved to tempt the cupidity of his guardians, and to make himself master of their firearms. There were still left to him a couple of seals, one gold, the other silver, and watching his opportunity, Sims flung them with a flourish in the fire. It fell out as he expected. The hungry troopers made a dash to save the trinkets. The prisoner seized a brace of pistols and leapt to the door. But alas, the pistols missed fire. Harry was immediately overpowered, and on the morrow was carried, sick and sorry, before the justice. From Dunstable he travelled his last journey to Newgate, and being condemned at the Old Bailey, he was hanged till he was dead and his body thereafter was carried for dissection to a surgeon's in that same Covent Garden where he first deserted his hackney cab for the pleasures of the town. Gentleman Harry was neither a brilliant thief nor a courteous highwayman. There was no touch of the grand manner, even in his prettiest achievement. His predecessors had made a pistol and a vizard an overwhelming terror and he did but profit by their tradition when he bade the cowed traveller stand and deliver. His profession, as he practised it, neither demanded skill nor incurred danger. Though he threatened death at every encounter, you never hear that he pulled a trigger throughout his career. If his opponent jeered and rode off, he rode off with a whole skin and a full pocket. Once even, this renowned adventurer accepted the cut of a riding-whip across his face, nor made any attempt to avenge the insult. But his manifold shortcomings were no hindrance to his success. Wherever he went, between London and York, he stopped coaches and levied his tax. A threatening voice, an arched eyebrow, an arrogant method of fingering an unloaded pistol, conspired with the craven, indolent habit of the time to make his every journey a procession of triumph. He was capable of performing all such feats as the age required of him. But you miss the spirit, the bravery, the urbanity and the wit, which made the adventurer of the seventeenth century a figure of romance. One point only of the great tradition did Harry Sims remember. He was never unwilling to restore a trinket made precious by sentiment. Once, when he took a gold ring from a gentleman's finger, a gentlewoman burst into tears, exclaiming, "'There goes your father's ring!' Whereupon Sims threw all his booty into a hat, saying, "'For God's sake, take that, or anything else you please!' In all other respects he was a bully, with the hesitancy of a coward, rather than the proper rival of Hind or Duval. Apart from the exercise of his trade, he was a very mohawk for brutality. He would ill-treat his victims whenever their drunkenness permitted the freedom, and he had no better gifts for the women who were kind to him than cruelty and neglect. One of his many imprisonments was the result of a monstrous ferocity. Unluckily, in a quarrel, he tells you gravely, I ran a crab-stick into a woman's eye and well did he deserve his sojourn in the new prison. At another time he rewarded the keeper of a coffee-house who supported him for six months by stealing her watch, and when she grumbled at his insolence he reflected with a chuckle that she could more easily bear the loss of her watch than the loss of her lover. Even in his gaiety there was an unpleasant spice of greed and truculence. 
Once, when he was still seen in fashionable company, he went to a masquerade dressed in a rich Spanish habit lent him by a captain in the guards, and he made so fine a show that he captivated a young and beautiful Cyprian, whom, when she would have treated him with generosity, he did but reward with the loss of all her jewels. Moreover, he had so small a regard for his craft that he would spoil his effects by drink or debauchery, and though a highwayman, he cared so little for style that he would as lief trick a drunken gamester as face his man on bagshot heath or beneath the shade of Epping Forest. You admire not his success, because like the success of the popular politician it depended rather upon his dupes than upon his merit. You approve not his raffish exploits in the hells of Covent Garden or Drury Lane, but you cannot withhold respect from his consistent dandyism, and you are grateful for the record that engaged in a mean enterprise he was dressed in a green velvet frock and a short laced waistcoat. Above all, his picturesque capture at Hockcliffe atones for much stupidity. The resolution wavering at the wine glass, the last drunken ride from St. Albans, these are inventions in experience which should make Sims immortal. And when he sits by the fireside a good deal chagrined, he recalls the arrest of a far greater man, even of Cartouche, who was surprised by the soldiers at his bedside stitching a torn pair of breeches. His autobiography, wherein he relates the truth as a dying man, seemed excellent in the eyes of Borrow, who loved it so well that he imagined the sentence, ascribed it falsely to Sims, and then rewarded it with extravagant applause. But Gentleman Harry knew how to tell a simple story, and the book, all wrote by myself while under sentence of death, is his best performance. In action he had many faults for if he was a highwayman among rakes, he was but a rake among highwaymen. End of section 17。section 18 of a book of scoundrels by Charles Wibley。this librivox recording is in the public domain。the switcher and gentleman Harry。Part three, a parallel. Haggart and Sims are united in the praise of Borrow and in the generous applause of posterity. Each resumes for his own generation the prowess of his kind. Each has assured his immortality by an experiment in literature. And if epic simplicity and rapid narrative are the virtues of biography, it is difficult to award the prize. The switcher preferred to write in the rough lingo wherein he best expressed himself. He packs his pages with ill-spelt slang, telling his story of thievery in the true language of thieves. Gentleman Harry, as became a person of quality, mimicked the dialect wherewith he was familiar in the more fashionable gambling dens of Covent Garden. Both write without the smallest suggestion of false shame or idle regret and a natural vanity lifts each of them out of the pit of commonplace onto the tableland of the heroic. They set forth their depredation as a victorious general might record his triumphs, and they excel the nimblest ordinary that ever penned a dying speech in all the gifts of the historian. But when you leave the study for the field, the switcher instantly declares his superiority. He had the happiness to practise his craft in its heyday, while Sims knew but the fag-end of a noble tradition. Haggart, moreover, was an expert, pursuing a difficult art, while Sims was a bully, plundering his betters by bluff. Sims boasted no quality which might be set off against the accurate delicacy of Haggart's hand. The Englishman grew rich upon a rolling eye and a rusty pistol. He put on his fiercest manner, and believed that the world would deny him nothing. The Scot, rejoicing in his exquisite skill, went to work without fuss or bluster, and added the joy of artistic pride to his delight in plunder. Though Sim's manner seems the more chivalrous, it required not one tithe of the courage which was Haggart's necessity. On horseback, with the semblance of a firearm, a man may easily challenge a coach full of women, 
it needs a cool brain and a sound courage to empty a pocket in the watchful presence of spies and policemen. While Gentleman Harry chose a lonely road, or the cover of night for his exploits, the switcher always worked by day, hustled by a crowd of witnesses. Their hours of leisure furnish a yet more striking contrast. Sims was a polished dandy, delighting in his clothes, unhappy if he were deprived of his bottle and his game. Haggart, on the other hand, was before all things sealed to his profession. He would have deserted the gayest masquerade, had he ever strayed into so light a frivolity, for the chance of lightening a pocket. He tasted but few amusements without the limits of his craft, and he preserved unto the end a touch of that dour character which is the heritage of his race. But, withal, he was an amiable, decent body, who would have recoiled in horror from the drunken brutality of Gentleman Harry. Though he bragged to George Coombe of his pitiless undoing of wenches, he never thrust a crabstick into a woman's eye, and he was incapable of rewarding a kindness by robbery and neglect. Once, at Newcastle, he arrayed himself in a smart white coat and tops, but the splendour ill became his red-headed awkwardness, and he would have stood aghast at the satin frocks and velvet waistcoats of him who broke the hearts of Drury Lane. But if he were gentler in his life, Haggart was prepared to fight with a more reckless courage when his trade demanded it. It was the gentleman's boast that he never shed the blood of man. When David found a turnkey between himself and freedom, he did not hesitate to kill, though his remorse was bitter enough when he neared the gallows. In brief, Haggart was not only the better craftsman, but the honester fellow, and though his hands were red with blood, he deserved his death far less than did the more truculent, less valiant Sims. Each had in his brain the stuff whereof men of letters are made. This is their parallel. And by way of contrast, while the switcher was an accomplished artist, Gentleman Harry was a roistering braggart. End of section 18section 19 of a book of scoundrels by charles wibley this librivox recording is in the public domain brodie and peace part 1 deacon brodie as william brodie stood at the bar on trial for his life he seemed the gallantest gentleman in court thither he had been carried in a chair and still conscious of the honour paid him he flashed a condescending smile upon his judges. His step was as jaunty as ever, his superb attire well became the deacon of a guild. His coat was blue, his vest a very garden of flowers, while his satin breeches and his stockings of white silk were splendid in their simplicity. Beneath the cocked hat his hair was fully dressed and powdered, and even the prosecuting counsel assailed him with the respect due to a man of fashion. The fellow's magnificence was thrown into relief by the squalor of his accomplice, for George Smith had neither the money nor the taste to disguise himself as a polished rogue, and he huddled as far from his master as he could in the rags of his mean estate. Nor from this moment did Brodie ever abate one jot of dignity. He faced his accusers with a clear eye and a frigid amiability. He listened to his sentence with a calm contempt. He laughed complacently at the sorry interludes of judicial wit, and he faced the last music with a bravery and a cynicism which bore the stamp of true greatness. It was not until after his crime that Brodie's heroism approved itself, and even then his was a triumph not of skill but of character. Always a gentleman in manner and conduct, he owed the success and failure of his life to this one quality. When in flight he made for Flushing on board the Endeavour, the other passengers, who knew not his name, straight away christened him the gentleman. The enterprise itself would have been impossible to one less persuasively gifted, and its proper execution is a tribute to the lofty quality of his mind. There he was in London, a stranger and a fugitive. Yet instead of crawling furtively into a coal-barge, he charters a ship, 
captures the confidence of the captain, carries the other passengers to Flushing when they were bound for Leith, and compels every one to confess his charm. The thief also found him irresistible, and while the game lasted, the flash kens of Edinburgh murmured the deacon's name in the hush whisper of respect. His fine temperament disarmed treachery. In London he visited an ancient doxy of his own, who, with her bully, shielded him from justice, though betrayal would have met with an ample reward. Smith, if he knew himself the superior craftsman, trembled at the deacon's nod, who thus swaggered it through life with none to withhold the exacted reverence. To this same personal compulsion he owed his worldly advancement. Deacon of the Rights Guild, while still a young man, he served upon the council, was known for one of Edinburgh's honoured citizens, and never went abroad unmarked by the finger of respectful envy. He was elected in 1773 a member of the Cape Club, and met at the Isle of Man Arms in Craig's Close the wittiest men of his time and town. Rayburn, Runciman, and Ferguson the poet were of the society, and it was with such as these that Brodie might have wasted his vacant hour. Indeed, at the very moment that he was cracking cribs and shaking the ivories, he was a chosen leader of fashion and gaiety, and it was the elegance of the gentleman that distinguished him from his fellows. The fop, indeed, had climbed the altitudes of life. The cracksman still stumbled in the valleys. If he had a ready cunning in the planning of an enterprise, he must needs bungle at the execution. And had he not been associated with George Smith, a king of scoundrels, there would be few exploits to record. And yet for the craft of housebreaker he had one solid advantage. He knew the locks and bolts of Edinburgh as he knew his primer, for had he not fashioned the most of them himself? But his knowledge once imparted to his accomplices, he cheerfully sank to a menial's office. In no job did he play a principal's part. He was merely told off by Smith or another to guard the entrance and sound the alarm. When McCain's on the bridge was broken, the deacon found the false keys. It was Smith who carried off such poor booty as was found. And though the master suggested the attack upon Bruce's shop, knowing full well the simplicity of the lock, he lingered at the vintners over a game of hazard, and let the man pouch a sumptuous booty. Even the onslaught upon the excise office, which cost his life, was contrived with appalling clumsiness. The deacon of the Rights Guild, who could slash wood at his will, who knew the artifice of every lock in the city, let his men go to work with no better implements than the stolen coulter of a plough and a pair of spurs. And when they tackled the ill-omened job, Brodie was of those who brought failure upon it. Long had they watched the door of the excise, long had they studied the habits of its clerks, so that they went to work in no vain spirit of experiment, nor on the fatal night did they force an entrance until they had dogged the porter to his home. Smith and Brown ransacked the place for money, while Brodie and Andrew Ainsley remained without to give a necessary warning, whereupon Ainsley was seized with fright, and Brodie, losing his head, called off the others, so that six hundred pounds were left that might have been an easy prey. Smith, indignant at the collapse of the long-pondered design, laid the blame upon his master, and they swung, as Brodie's grim spirit of farce suggested, for four pounds apiece. The humours of the situation were all the deacon's own. He dressed the part in black, his respectability grinned behind a vizard, and all the while he trifled nonchalantly with a pistol. Breaking the silence with snatches from the beggar's opera, he promised that all their lead should turn to gold, christened the coulter and the crow, the great and little Samuel, and then went off to drink and dice at the vintners. How could anger prevail against this undying gaiety? And if Smith were peevish at failure, he was presently reconciled, and prepared once more to die for his deacon. Even after escape the amateur is still apparent. True, he managed the trip to Flushing with his ancient extravagance. True, he employed all the juggleries of the law to prevent his surrender at Amsterdam. But he knew not the caution of the born criminal, 
and he was run to earth because he would still write to his friends like a gentleman. His letters during this nightmare of disaster are perfect in their carelessness and good fellowship. In this he demands news of his children, as becomes a father and a citizen, and furnishes a schedule for their education. In that he is curious concerning the issue of a main, and would know whether his black cock came off triumphant. Nor even in flight did he forget his proper craft, but would have his tool sent to Charleston, that in America he might resume the trade that had made him deacon. But his was the art of conduct, not of guile, and he deserved capture for his rare indifference. Why, then, with no natural impulsion, did he risk the gallows? Why, being no born thief, and innocent of the thief's cunning, did he associate with so clever a scoundrel as George Smith, with cowards craven as Brown and Ainsley? The greed of gold doubtless half persuaded him, but gold was otherwise attainable, and the motive was assuredly far more subtle. Brodie, in fact, was of a romantic turn. He was, so to say, a glorified schoolboy, surfeited with penny dreadfuls. He loved above all things to patter the flash, to dream himself another Macheath, to trick himself out with all the trappings of a crime he was unfit to commit. It was never the job itself that attracted him. He would always rather throw the dice than force a neighbour's window, but he must needs have a distraction from the respectability of his life. Everybody was at his feet. He was deacon of his guild at an age whereat his fellows were striving to earn a reputable living. His masterpieces were fashioned, and the rights trade was already a burden. To go upon the cross seemed a dream of freedom, until he snapped his fingers at the world, filled his mouth with slang, prepared his alibi, and furnished him a whole wardrobe of disguises. With a conscious irony, maybe, he buried his pistols beneath the domestic hearth, jammed his dark lantern into the press where he kept his gamecocks, and determined to make an inextricable jumble of his career. Drink is sometimes a sufficient reaction against the orderliness of a successful life, but drink and cards failed with the deacon, and at the vintners of his frequentation he encountered accomplices proper for his schemes. Never was so outrageous a protest offered against domesticity. Yet Brodie's resolution was romantic after its fashion, and was far more respectable than the blackguardism of the French Revolution, which distracted housewifely discontent a year after the deacon swung. Moreover, it gave occasion for his dandyism and his love of display. If in one incarnation he was the complete gentleman, in another he dressed the part of the perfect scoundrel, and the list of his costumes would have filled one of his own ledgers. But when once the possibility of housebreaking was taken from him, he returned to his familiar dignity. Being questioned by the procurator fiscal, he shrugged his shoulders, regretting that other affairs demanded his attention, as who should say it is unpardonable to disturb the meditations of a gentleman. He made a will bequeathing his knowledge of the law to the magistrates of Edinburgh, his dexterity in cards and dice to Hamilton the chimney-sweeper, and all his bad qualities to his good friends and old companions, Brown and Ainsley, not doubting, however, that their own will secure them a rope at last. In prison it was his worst complaint that, though the nails of his toes and fingers were not quite so long as Nebuchadnezzar's, they were long enough for a mandarin, and much longer than he found convenient. Thus he preserved an untroubled demeanour until the day of his death, Always polite and even joyous, he met the smallest indulgence with enthusiasm. When Smith complained that a respite of six weeks was of small account, Brodie exclaimed, "'George, what would you and I give for six weeks longer? Six weeks would be an age to us.' The day of execution was the day of his supreme triumph. As some men are artists in their lives, so the deacon was an artist in his death. Nothing became him so well as his manner of leaving the world. There is never a blot upon this exquisite performance. It is superb, impeccable. Again his dandyism supported him, and he played the part of a dying man in a full suit of black, his hair, as always, dressed and powdered. 
The day before he had been jovial and sparkling. He had chanted all his flash songs, and cracked the jokes of a man of fashion. But he set out for the gallows with a firm step and a rigorous demeanour. He offered a prayer of his own composing, and, O oh Lord, he said, I lament that I know so little of thee. The patronage and the confession are alike characteristic. As he drew near the scaffold, the model of which he had given to his native city a few years since, he stepped with an agile briskness. He examined the halter destined for his neck with an impartial curiosity. His last pleasantry was uttered as he ascended the table. George, he muttered, you are first in hand. And thereafter he took farewell of his friends. Only one word of petulance escaped his lips. When the halters were found too short, his contempt for the slovenly workmanship urged him to protest, and to demand a punishment for the executioner. Again ascending the table, he assured himself against further mishap by arranging the rope with his own hands. Thus he was turned off in a brilliant assembly. The provost and magistrates, in respect for his dandyism, were resplendent in their robes of office and though the crowd of spectators rivalled that which paid a tardy honour to Jonathan Wilde, no one was hurt save the customary policeman. Such was the dignified end of a double life. And the duplicity is the stranger, because the real deacon was not Brody the cracksman, but Brody the gentleman. So lightly did he esteem life, that he tossed it from him in a careless impulse. So little did he fear death, that, what is hanging? he asked. A leap in the dark. End of section 19。section 20 of a book of scoundrels by Charles Wibley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Brody and Peace. Part 2. Charles Peace. Charles Peace, after the habit of his kind, was born of scrupulously honest parents. The son of a religious file-maker, he owed to his father not only his singular piety, but his love of edged tools. As he never encountered an iron bar whose scission baffled him, so there never was a fire-eating Methodist to whose ministrations he would not turn a repentant ear. After a handy portico and a rich booty, he loved nothing so well as a soul-stirring discourse. Not even his precious fiddle occupied a larger space in his heart than that devotion which the ignorant have termed hypocrisy. Wherefore his career was no less suitable to his ambition than his inglorious end, for he lived the king of housebreakers, and he died a warning to all evildoers with a prayer of intercession trembling upon his lips. The hero's boyhood is wrapped in obscurity. It is certain that no glittering precocity brought disappointment to his maturer years, and he was already nineteen when he achieved his first imprisonment. Even then t'was a sorry offence, which merited no more than a month, so that he returned to freedom and his fiddle with his character unbesmirched. Serious as ever in pious exercises, he gained a scanty living as a strolling musician. There was never a tavern in Sheffield where the twang of his violin was unheard, and the skill wherewith he extorted music from a single string earned him the style and title of the modern Paganini. But such an employ was too mean for his pride, and he soon got to work again, this time with a better success. The mansions of Sheffield were his early prey, and a rich plunder rewarded his intrepidity. The design was as masterly as its accomplishment. The grand style is already discernible. The houses were broken in quietude and good order. None saw the opened window. None heard the step upon the stair. In truth, the victim's loss was his first intelligence. But when the booty was in the robber's own safe keeping, the empiricism of his method was revealed. As yet he knew no secret and efficient fence to shield him from detection. As yet he had not learnt that the complete burglar works alone. This time he knew two accomplices, women both, and one his own sister. 
A paltry pair of boots was the clue of discovery, and a good stretch was the proper reward of a clumsy indiscretion. So for twenty years he wavered between the crowbar and the prison house, now perfecting a brilliant scheme, now captured through recklessness or drink. Once, when a mistake at Manchester sent him to the hulks, he owned his failure was the fruit of brandy, and after his wont delivered from the dock a little homily upon the benefit of sobriety. Meanwhile his art was growing to perfection. He had at last discovered that a burglary demands as diligent a forethought as a campaign. He had learnt that no great work is achieved by a multitude of minds. Before his boat carried off a goodly parcel of silk from Nottingham, he was known to the neighbourhood as an enthusiastic and skilful angler. One day he dangled his line, the next he sat peacefully at the same employ, and none suspected that the mild-mannered fisherman had, under the cloud of night, dispatched a costly parcel to London. Even the years of imprisonment were not ill-spent. Peace was still preparing the great achievement of his life, and he framed from solitary reflection, as well as from his colleagues in crime, many an ingenious theory, afterwards fearlessly translated into practice. And when at last he escaped the slavery of the jail, picture-framing was the pursuit which covered the sterner business of his life. His depredation involved him in no suspicion. His changing features rendered recognition impossible. When the exercise of his trade compelled him to shoot a policeman at Wally Range, another was sentenced for the crime. And had he not encountered Mrs. Dyson, who knows but he might have practised his art in prosperous obscurity until claimed by a coward's death. But a stormy love-passage with Mrs. Dyson led to the unworthy killing of the woman's husband a crime unnecessary, and in no sense consonant to the burglar's craft. And Charles Peace was an outlaw, with a reward set upon his head. And now came a period of true splendour. Like Fielding, like Cervantes, like Stern, Peace reserved his veritable masterpiece for the certainty of middle life. His last two years were nothing less than a march of triumph. If you remember his constant danger, you will realise the grandeur of the scheme. From the moment that Peace left Bannercross with Dyson's blood upon his hands, he was a hunted man. His capture was worth five hundred pounds. His features were familiar to a hundred hungry detectives. Had he been less than a man of genius, he might have taken an unavailing refuge in flight or concealment. But, content with no safety unaffected by affluence, he devised a surer plan he became a householder. Now a semi-detached villa is an impregnable stronghold. Respectability oozes from the dusky mortar of its bricks, and escapes in clouds of smoke from its soot-grimed chimneys. No policeman ever detects a desperate ruffian in a demure black-coated gentleman who day after day turns an iron gate upon its rusty hinge. And thus, wrapped in a cloak of suburban piety, Peace waged a pitiless and effective war upon his neighbours. He pillaged Blackheath, Greenwich, Peckham, and many another home of honest worth, with a noiselessness and a precision that were the envy of the whole family. The unknown and intrepid burglar was a terror to all the clerkdom of the city, and though he was as secret and secluded as Peace, the two heroes were never identified. At the time of his true eminence he resided in Evelina Road, Peckham, and none was more sensible than he how well the address became his provincial refinement. There he installed himself with his wife and Mrs. Thompson. His drawing-room suite was the envy of the neighbourhood. His pony-trap proclaimed him a man of substance. His gentle manners won the respect of all Peckham. Hither he would invite his friends to such entertainments as the suburb expected. His musical evenings were recorded in the local paper, while on Sundays he chanted the songs of Zion with a zeal which Clapham herself might envy. The house in Evelina Road was no mere haunt of quiet gentility. It was chosen with admirable forethought and with a stern eye upon the necessities of business. Beyond the garden wall frowned a railway embankment which enabled the cracksman to escape from his house without opening the front door. 
By the same embankment, he might, if he chose, convey the trophies of the night's work. And what mattered it if the windows rattled to the passing train? At least a cloud of suspicion was dispelled. Here he lived for two years with naught to disturb his tranquillity, save Mrs. Thompson's taste for drink. The hours of darkness were spent in laborious activity. The open day brought its own distractions. There was always Bow Street wherein to loaf, and the study of the criminal law lost none of its excitement from the reward offered outside for the bald-headed fanatic who sat placidly within. And the love of music was Peace's constant solace. Whatever treasures he might discard in a hurried flight, he never left a fiddle behind, and so vast became his pilfered collection that he had to borrow an empty room in a friend's house for its better disposal. Moreover, he had a fervent pride in his craft, and you might deduce from his performance the whole theory and practice of burglary. He worked ever without accomplices. He knew neither the professional thief nor his lingo, and no association with jailbirds involved him in the risk of treachery and betrayal. His single colleague was a friendly fence, and not even at the gallows foot would he surrender the fence's name. His master quality was a constructive imagination. Accident never marred his design. He would visit the house of his breaking until he understood its ground plan and was familiar with its inhabitants. This demanded an amazing circumspection, but Peace was as stealthy as a cat, and he would keep silent vigil for hours rather than fail from an overkeen anxiety. Having marked the place of his entry, and having chosen an appropriate hour, he would prevent the egress of his enemies by screwing up the doors. He then secured the room wherein he worked, and the job finished, he slung himself into the night by the window, so that ere an alarm could be raised, his pony trap had carried the booty to Evelina Road. Such was the outline of his plan, but being no pedant, he varied it at will. Nor was he likely to court defeat through lack of resource. Accomplished as he was in his proper business, he was equally alert to meet the accompanying risks. He had bought the art of cousining strange dogs to perfection, and for the exigence of escape his physical equipment was complete. He would resist capture with unparalleled determination, and though he shuddered at the shedding of blood, he never hesitated when necessity bade him pull the trigger. Moreover, there was no space into which he would not squeeze his body, and the iron bars were not yet devised through which he could not make an exit. Once, it was at Nottingham, he was surprised by an inquisitive detective who demanded his name and trade. "'I am a hawker of spectacles,' replied Peace, "'and my licence is downstairs. Wait two minutes, and I'll show it to you.' The detective never saw him again. Six inches only separated the bars of the window, but Peace asked no more and thus silently he won his freedom. True, his most daring feat, the leap from the train, resulted not in liberty but in a broken head. But he essayed a task too high even for his endeavour, and despite his manacles at least he left his boot in the astonished warder's grip. No less remarkable than his skill and daring were his means of evasion. Even without a formal disguise he could elude pursuit. At an instant's warning his loose plastic features would assume another shape. Out shot his lower jaw, and as if by magic the blood flew into his face until you might take him for a mulatto. Or, if he chose, he would strap his arm to his side and let the police be baffled by a wooden mechanism, decently finished with a hook. Thus he roamed London, up and down, unsuspected. And even after his last failure at Blackheath, none would have discovered Charles Peace in John Ward, the single-handed burglar, had not woman's treachery prompted detection. Indeed, he was an epitome of his craft, the complete burglar made manifest. Not only did he plan his victories with previous ingenuity, but he sacrificed to his success both taste and sentiment. His dress was always of the most sombre, his only wear was the decent black of everyday godliness. The least spice of dandyism might have distinguished him from his fellows, 
and Peace's whole vanity lay in his craft. Nor did the paltry sentiment of friendship deter him from his just course. When the panic aroused by the silent burglar was uncontrolled, a neighbour consulted Peace concerning the safety of his house. The robber, having duly noted the villa's imperfections, and having discovered the hiding-place of jewellery and plate, complacently rifled it the next night. Though his self-esteem sustained a shock, though henceforth his friend thought meanly of his judgment, he was rewarded with the solid pudding of plunder, and the world whispered of the mysterious marauder with a yet colder horror. In truth, the large simplicity and solitude of his style sets him among the classics, and though others have surpassed him at single points of the game, he practised the art with such universal breadth and courage as were then a revolution, and are still unsurpassed. But the burglar ever fights an unequal battle. One false step and defeat overwhelms him. For two years had John Ward intimidated the middle-class seclusion of South London. For two years had he hidden from a curious world the ugly, furrowed visage of Charles Peace. The bald head, the broad-rimmed spectacles, the squat, thick figure he stood but five feet four in his stockings, and adds yet another to the list of little great men, should have ensured detection. But the quick change and the persuasive gesture were omnipotent and until the autumn of 1878 peace was comfortably at large. And then an encounter at Blackheath put him within the clutch of justice. His revolver failed in its duty, and valiant as he was, at last he met his match. In prison he was alternately insolent and aggrieved. He blustered for justice, proclaimed himself the victim of sudden temptation, and insisted that his intention had been ever innocent. But none the less he was sentenced to a lifer, and the mask of John Ward being torn from him, he was sent to Sheffield to stand his trial as Charles Peace. The leap from the train is already recorded, and at his last appearance in the dock he rolled upon the floor, a petulant and broken man. When once the last doom was pronounced, he forgot both fiddle and crowbar. He surrendered himself to those exercises of piety from which he had never wavered. The foolish have denounced him for a hypocrite, not knowing that the artist may have a life apart from his art, and that to peace religion was an essential pursuit. So he died, having released from an unjust sentence the poor wretch who at Wally Range had suffered for his crime, and offering up a consolatory prayer for all mankind. In truth there was no enemy for whom he did not intercede. He prayed for his jailers, for his executioner, for the ordinary, for his wife, for Mrs. Thompson, his drunken doxy, and he went to his death with the sure step of one who, having done his duty, is reconciled with the world. The mob testified its affectionate admiration by dubbing him Charlie, and remembered with effusion his last grim pleasantry. "'What is the scaffold?' he asked with sublime earnestness, and the answer came quick and sanctimonious. A shortcut to heaven. End of section twenty.